Gone, but not forgotten. The impacts of the 2023 legislative session still linger. What passed and what didn't. The chair of House Education explains how it was handled in her committee. The weather today, quite a difference from a couple of weeks ago when Treefort Music Fest took over Julia Davis Park. And both seem to have taken the soul out of the sod. But Boise Parks and Rec, eh, they aren't too worried about the revival. Springtime and the animals are on the move, heading back north, into the mountains, and across the interstate. What was seen and heard. The 2023 legislative session may have officially come to a close last Thursday, but we're still kind of within that window of assessing what lawmakers did over their 12 plus weeks in town. Before the session, we knew Idaho getting some sort of education savings account set up to send public money to private education was a high priority for, well, a minority of lawmakers. And one of them made it through the Senate Education Committee. That would be Senate Bill 1038, but that one failed on the floor. After that vote in late February, we were told to watch for a few possible ESA bills coming up through the House side. And they were brought up, but they just never made it out of the House Education Committee. And we learned why during a hearing on March 2nd. I have kept a, a file with all the emails that are coming in and it's easily, I haven't counted absolutely all of them, but it's easily five to one that people in the state are saying that they don't want this. I've had an overwhelming number of emails to support um, a no on, essentially no on going forward with what I call a parallel system. My emails are running at least five to one against from my district. And I share the same district with Cloud. That's probably part of my concern here. Yeah, five to one against from the same district as a lawmaker who was proposing it. That would be Representative Clow. Well, we thought we would find out. And according to the thousands of emails members of the House Education Committee got during these debates, that'd be McCann, Sauter, and Lanting, as you just saw. Well, they were right. It was overwhelmingly against any sort of ESA. Like this, for an example, dear Representative Greg Lanting, public dollars being uh, belong in public schools. Please protect our public schools and vote no on the ESA vouchers. There's no oversight, accountability, and they have been a disaster in other states. Be smart and vote no. I've been an educator for 21 years and a teacher in Idaho for 11 of those. I've taught in one of Idaho's public schools that already shows the effects of chronic underfunding. School district in Post Falls already has a $39 million of deferred maintenance projects. ESAs and vouchers are simply not necessary in our state. We already have programs that allow parents choice in Idaho. I'm writing to ask you vote no on ESA vouchers. I've lived in Haley for more than 40 years and I have one grandchild in elementary school in Boise. One is going to attend the same elementary school next year. Taking money from my grandson's school to support private schools, mostly for kids that can already afford to go there, is unfair and will hurt children like ours. I have friends in Salmon, other small rural towns, and they say they don't need them. In fact, no rural school can afford to lose funding for their schools. Don't be fooled by the siren song of the Idaho Freedom Foundation, this one says, the Mountain States Policy Center, or factions of similar ilk who seem to be the primary purveyors of indoctrination tactics within Idaho. Moving forward with these schemes will erode the funding base for public schools and may be used for religious or sectarian purposes. Private education is unregulated, not bound by any of the requirements public schools must follow. And there were several of these, a lot of them coming through in like form letters. So we only shared the ones that were personally written with you, or at least a few of them. So you can see why the House Education Committee passed a, or failed to pass any sort of voucher or education savings account or opportunity program bill, whatever you want to call it. The same could be said for any library bill that came through that committee, of which there were two. The one that did pass all the way to the governor's desk, by the way, that would be House Bill 314. That one bypassed the House Ed Committee and went through state affairs to the chagrin of at least the House Ed co-chair. The House Ed Committee was an eventful one, to say the least, this session. So we wanted to get a session assessment from the committee chair. That'd be Republican Representative Julie Yamamoto from Caldwell. A retired teacher and principal, she has seen how schools and libraries operate from the inside and didn't really buy into many of these outside views. It was her first session as committee chair, and Representative Yamamoto said, she saw the same thing from her constituents in District 11 when it came to ESAs. Overwhelming opposition. Madam Chair, that's what I heard as well. You know, if the system isn't working for a child. I feel like that we have a system in place that allows for voices to be heard. Parents have no, no option. But what it doesn't allow is that when somebody decides they're right, and no matter how many times they've been told, well, we hear what you're saying, but this is how this is going to be, that, that no isn't an answer that they're willing to accept. 
And I think that we saw that play out over and over in House Ed as well. It played out with ESAs. The motion has failed. So and during the library bills debates, if going to general orders highlighted the by the March 1st abrupt exit from the House Ed Committee by Representative Judy Boyle. Shame. I was just appalled that the majority of our committee thought it was OK to protect porn instead of kids. And that was the limit for me. Yeah, we never talked about that, and we still have never talked about it. I mean, do you wish that she had spoken to you before she just abruptly quit? Well, I always would hope that the last thing that I ever want to do is break relationship with anyone, and I have long respected her and counted her as a friend, and um, I have decided to not take it personally because um, she didn't say she quit me. She said she wasn't going to be on the committee anymore. Um, yes, I wish that we could have had a talk. And at some point, we probably will. But sometimes when emotions are running high, it might be the wiser thing to not engage in that conversation until both parties are ready. You know, it's also true, but not nearly so funny. Speaking of emotions. Bills that have serious issues. As a committee chair, you had a lot of attention drawn pointed at you. A lot of it not so good this session. I mean, you've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't the favorite for everyone, that's for sure. What do you think about this, this push and some of the, especially on social media, some of this rhetoric? Right. Well, it might disappoint some of those folks to know I don't go on and I make a point of not looking at any of it because I think it's designed to intimidate, to cause fear, to, uh, and I saw what they did with other legislators and so I knew um, it was coming and um, as a believer I don't believe that that's how we should treat people even when we don't agree with what they're doing. Representative Yamamoto says she's seen it because people have sent it to her. I kidded to my husband I said well it's the only way I'll make it onto the cover of Playboy you know <laughs> uh, and it was one of my better pictures so I wasn't I thought well okay I guess I would just say that's not how I would go about letting someone know that I'm not happy with what they're how they're approaching something or their their opinion of something I still find it somewhat amusing only that uh, you know it's gotten so mean-spirited that it's it's lost a lot of its humor what does this mean a vote of no confidence well, I, I know to them it means um, that they are hoping that the central committees will have more uh, decision-making ability over who the candidates are. And they, they're, what they're really trying to do is that they want to weed out people that they feel like uh, are not as conservative, not as, um, well, I guess I'll just leave it at that because they, uh, don't appreciate being called either far right or extremist. When you raise your right hand and take your oath, it wasn't to follow the Republican platform, it was to make sure that whatever you did follows the U.S. Constitution and the Idaho Constitution. The platform should give guidance as to what uh, those that are at the meeting believe, but let's remember that it wasn't that many sessions ago in a winter meeting when somebody brought up uh, that they wanted Klingon to be the official language of the Idaho GOP. <laughs> <sighs> so, you know, let's be willing to at least admit that maybe the five or 600 people there were able to get 300, 400 people to vote for these different things, but does that really represent all of Idaho? If it's good law, then let's make sure that all parts of it are good and that we mitigate for unintended consequences. Can we always do all of it? No, but just to say, well, let's get it on the books and then we'll fix it as we need to, I, I don't think that that's why anyone should be uh, elected, is to come and just see how many bills you can pass and then fix them when you need to. Are you worried about the direction of the party? Yes. I think it's, um, this is how I see it. I don't know if you're familiar with a cowbird, but a cowbird lays their egg in a different bird's nest, and then they take off to do whatever cowbirds do. And when that egg hatches, that 
baby birds larger than the other ones and so is more apt to get the food or even will push out other baby birds so that there isn't competition. I think they are radicalized. I think it is extreme and <clears throat> I think <clears throat> they are the Republicans in name only. They're the cowbirds who have come in and they're trying to take over and tell us as Idahoans who have lived here our, all, all of our lives or even people who have come and who have accepted this is the, how we do things in Idaho, that it's not good enough. And all this fear and anger is fomented and it raises money and it uh, can be distilled to, to bumper stickers and little <clears throat> three word phrases that stick in people's mind doesn't mean it's right. Representative Yamamoto told us she truly believes Idahoans don't want more laws, they just want reasonable ones. And what she heard again and again from them before and during the session, property tax, property tax, oh, and education. But too often social issues take over and while they may be worth a consideration, they do take a lot of time. And she wonders how you balance those with what constituents really want and of course what the Constitution says. She also told us she had friends come up to her, who she's known for years and say, huh, porn given to children, is that what you want? Representative Yamamoto believes this false dichotomy debate technique needs to be set aside, at least at the Idaho State House. So one of the early storylines of this year's Tree Fort Music Festival, the new venues and how they would work for the five day event. Main shows went from being held in parking lots downtown to one of Boise's most popular parks. We heard rave reviews for the music hall in Bodo and how shows were showcased in Julia Davis Park. However, shortly after the shows, there was concern how the park, specifically the grass, held up with the thousands of people trotting all over it while it rained, mind you. And it did take its toll, but Boise Parks and Rec says it may not be as bad as it looked. Here's Joe Paris. Nothing pleases a park and recreation director in any community in the country than to see their facilities and parks get used. That's the most important. Build a park and nobody comes is probably not a good thing. It's that spirit from Boise Parks and Recreation Director Doug Holloway that encourages big events in Boise's beautiful parks. And what better super show idea than to combine Julia Davis Park with the Tree Fort Music Festival? It was a great event and it put a lot of money into our economy. And again, that's a, a big part of Parks and Recreation is what can we do to help drive economic uh, impact within our community. The word impact, though, drew questions. What would a music festival with thousands do to a park? Add in a week straight of cold and wet weather. Yeah, it took a toll there. I imagine there's conversations. Okay, we assume there'll be some type of damage. Oh yeah, we, we were watching the forecast really close and, and so were the tree fort organizers as well. And, and, but our response to that is rain or shine, this event's going to come off. And so let's, let's make the best of, of how we can make this event work the best for the people that come here. And we'll deal with 
what the, what the after effects are. As you can imagine, the grass in high traffic areas basically turn to mud as Tree Fort fans dance their way through the park and join live music, shows, and great conversations. And guess what the Boise Parks and Recreation Director thinks about all of it. That's what a park is for. But there is a cost to fix the consequences of fun. One that Tree Fort organizers are totally on board with. The price tag's about $41,000, and it's come solely from uh, the tree fort usage in the park, the things that we have to do to bring it back up to where it was uh, before the event occurred. Holloway says... The well, that story was actually supposed to continue. Our... Uh our apologies on that one, but Brian, the uh, the forty-six thousand dollar, excuse me, forty-one thousand dollar price tag is uh, basically paid for by Tree Fort, and they understand that this was actually an event where this is, in terms of conditions, they thought this is about as bad as it could be in terms of mud and the grass and everything they dealt with. So, in the sense that that was okay, this is what we have to deal with. Things are looking good for the future of Tree Fort Music Fest at that spot. Um, there was another piece of conversation going into Tree Fort and really throughout Tree Fort as well about the uh, the animals at Zoo Boise. There yeah. were concerns maybe to be too loud for them. Right. I mean, that stage was set up right next to the zoo. Yeah, and some of those animals, like the draft, for example, they have their enclosures outside and they're exposed to, you know, they're exposed to noise, but not usually a live rock show. When the sun goes down, they're supposed to go to sleep. And, uh, you know, Tree Fort, well, you kind of get more activated. <laughs> the, as the other way around. The other way around. But, uh, yeah, the Zoo Boise says they had no no issues with the, the animals there. They kept the decibel level low and nice. they actually had done a lot of work with other zoos around the country saying, hey, if, if you've had a big music event at your zoo, how did it go? So they knew what the decibel level need to be. I think it was 75 decibels, so no problems. And uh, the grass is regrowing itself and it's really, uh, I guess it's really resilient out yeah. at Julia Davis Park. So I think that's the bottom line is it looked terrible at the time while you were there. Yeah. They're going to pay to help replace anything that needs to be replaced, but nature is going to take care of the rest down there at Julia Davis Park. It's kind of what we're uh, led to understand. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and turfing and seeding, there's going to be a little bit of that. The area right outside the Gene Harris band shell, that actually has uh, – going to need some turfing that okay. a contractor is going to come in and do. But really throughout the rest of the park, and you can go see it for yourself, it looks pretty normal. They're going to overseed it, as they call it, to get everything ready for the summer events. But uh, Doug Holloway, Boise Parks and Rec, on their end, things look good for Tree Fort. So Tree Fort can expect me back there next year. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll see you, though. Thanks, Joe.
Just as many of us predicted, jumping straight from winter into summer with barely a glimpse of spring. That's what it's felt like through this weekend from one extreme to another, as my good friend Jamie put it on my Facebook post about a new record set today. And we set a couple of records on Saturday as well for the latest 60 degree or warmer day for Boise and also for the longest stretch without 60, 157 days. Then we made it to the low 70s on Sunday and now the low 80s. This, in fact, is not our official high for the day today. National Weather Service reports we made it up to 82 degrees in Boise, 85 in Ontario, and even 50s up to 60 degrees in some of our mountain valleys. Haley Sun Valley area made it up to near 60 degrees. Average high for this time of year, we just cruised right past it. 61 degrees, the old record for today, set back in 1968 of 80 degrees. So a warm and very windy day. The wind is because we have that cooler air that's waiting on deck. So these two air masses are so different. They're kind of battling it out at this point. High pressure trying to fill that void that the low pressure has for our atmosphere. And eventually this cold front will be sweeping through our area. It doesn't mean much for us in the way of precipitation, but it will keep the wind machine on for the next couple of days. And it will also be noticeably cooler tomorrow. You're probably looking at these highs right now and thinking, OK, that's not so bad. That's still above average 64 degrees. I, we've been looking forward to days like this. However, this doesn't tell the whole story for the day tomorrow because I think we cruise there in the morning hours and then we back off as that cold front makes its way through in the afternoon. So probably hitting our highs sometime around 10, 11 a.m. And then the wind shifts directions to come out of the northwest and we see temperatures falling back off into the 50s for tomorrow afternoon. A look at the seven day forecast for the Boise area. At least there's no you know, snow icons here, but the temperatures certainly drop well below average as we head through the middle of the week and then return to spring 60s and even 70s by the time we hit the weekend. Don't you love it when it shapes up just in time for the weekend? And it's a similar cool down for the Magic Valley as well, with the exception of that cold front not rolling through until late tomorrow. So another day at 70 degrees for Twin Falls tomorrow and then the cooler air drops in coolest day of the week on the way Thursday. You can always find the forecast at KT tvb.com and here's something that is so idaho like we like to say while a lot of you are enjoying your easter egg hunts or dinners with family yesterday there's an elk moving operation was being executed you might have experienced a slight disturbance if you're driving along interstate 50 near exit 15 that is near exit 80 and when i say slight disturbance i mean just kind of like stopping of traffic to watch these guys go by multiple agencies helped move hundreds of elk across the interstate so they could get to the east side of the road shoshone bannock tribes fish and game first are said first they moved those 150 elk south of the exit 80 and then they moved them across the other side and you see them in a hurry there about 389 elk in that entire herd a few stragglers there they did not uh, get left behind, though, not to worry. A lot of people taking some photos, some videos, of course. The elk had to be moved because, well, they're wintering so close to the interstate. Some of them are wander wandering onto the roadway. So they pushed the elk successful east in the mountains, well, so everyone can be safe.
All right, the 208 text line turning into a representative Yamamoto fan page today. A lot of you sending in your comments like these, several of them very much, well, show, throwing uh, kudos to Representative Yamamoto, who's the chair of the House Education Committee. I'm encouraged by our Idaho House leadership when I see people like Julie Yamamoto as a committee chair. What a bright spot in our legislature, says Roy. Continues with Jan saying Representative Yamamoto's cowbird analogy was perfect, but it probably flew right over the heads of the IFF. Thank you, Representative Yamamoto. What a breath of fresh air you are. Please continue to be a voice of reason and a sea of lunacy. That's Pam in Grandview. And again, these messages coming from all over outside of her district, even those outside saying, yeah, I would love to vote for her, people like her to continue in the legislature. Julie Yamamoto is one of the good Republicans. She uses common sense. We need more like her, says Carol. There's more. Representative Yamamoto, good for you for speaking your truth. More is needed. They can't handle the truth, says Mike in Twin Falls. Another one. It just keeps coming. Julie Yamamoto is clearly one of the most well-founded leaders that demonstrates Idaho values. Her compassion for service should be modeled by so many in the Idaho GOP. Her wisdom, kindness, and courage are stellar. The Cali family will always support her in all charges she leads. That's from Pat Cali, by the way. Thanks for sending that in today. Hard to believe a Republican, Julie Yamamoto, who is articulate, honest, and believes in individual freedom from big government. That's Steve Broden in Boise. Let's see if we got one more here. Thank you for the excellent interview with Representative Yamamoto. She was well-spoken, intelligent, and real. Not traits we always get to see in many in the majority party. All right. This false dichotomy needs to stop everywhere, not just in the State House. Just stop the propaganda. Dan referring to the false dichotomy that Representative Yamamoto talked about, whether it's either you're against us or you're with us. It's always black and white. The idea that she was voting down a bill, but therefore she must be for porn in libraries, which isn't a thing. It's kind of thing she got tired of hearing this entire session, as did a lot of others as well. We'll see if we can pick up tomorrow. We'll see you then.